Well, we're continuing on in our study through uh, the book of 2 Samuel. As you know, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, they're all one book. But we've divided them up into nice bite-sized pieces. And in all of this, 1 Samuel dealt with the prophet, the judge, Samuel. And at the end of the epic, the period or the time of the judges, moving into the time of kings with King Saul, the first one anointed. That took us through 1 Samuel. And at the end of 1 Samuel, and the beginning here of 2 Samuel, Saul dies, and now David is going to step up into the role that he was anointed for 20 years earlier. And as he consolidates his kingdom, uh, he, he moves into Hebron, and they anoint him a second time. And finally, after a, a number of skirmishes and a, a false king and uh, some troubles within the nation, a uh, little precursor to what's going to happen with the divided nation after uh, his son Solomon, uh, David's able to gather everybody around him. And what we saw last week, he ended with uh, conquering Jebus, which is the fortified city in the center of Judah that for all the time of the conquest of the promised land and through the time of the judges, the Jebusites had this uh, fortress this citadel. Uh, in the Hebrew, the word is Zion. They had a place that was virtually impenetrable. But David, through cunning and skill, and, and through Joab, his right-hand man, uh, figured out how to get in through the water shaft at the Gihon Springs, come up into the, uh, into the town, and they said even the blind and the lame could defend this city. It's so fortified, but they didn't look for the, the, that hole in their defenses. And and David conquers Jebus and, and sets it up as his capital, which is a pretty great move strategically because it's never been part of, although it's within the territory of Judah, it's never been part of any of the tribes, so they can't make a claim that, oh, David's showing favorites. He made his capital in so-and-so's tribe. So that went really well. This place that he conquered, this city of Jebus, we know it better and we, we actually met it way back in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 14, Abraham uh, has divided from Lot, and then when Lot's down in Sodom and Gomorrah, a bunch of kings come and kidnap him and take everybody away. Abraham chases them, routes them, brings them back, saves them, and on the way back, he passes by Jebus. And the king of Jebus comes out to bless him. In Genesis chapter 14, we read about this in verses 18 through 20. It's a small passage, and for a lot of people, you just pass right over it, but it's huge. It says, verse 18, then Melech Zedak. Melech means king, Zedak means righteous, the king of righteousness, Melchizedek king of Salem, the city of Salem, Shalom, city, Yeru, uh, peace or Salem, Shalom, Yeru, Shalom. So this is the king of righteousness of the city of Jerusalem brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the most high, of God most high, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham, God of most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave a tithe of everything to Melchizedek. And that's the last we hear about Melchizedek. Uh, there is one mention of him in Psalm 110, where it talks about the offspring of King David, which we're going to talk about tonight will be a king according, a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And then you have to wait till the book of Hebrews, where we get three chapters explaining who this king of righteousness from the city of peace, Jerusalem, is, and is speaking of none other than Jesus Christ, Messiah. Okay? So, David has now conquered Jerusalem and set that up as his town, the, the is Zion, Mount Zion, because it's so fortified all the way around. 
Uh, it's also known as the city of David from here on out. And then at verse 1 of chapter 6, going on with the story, again David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. So he's putting together a big army right now. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Okay? Now, we kind of know this story. This is about David bringing the ark into Jerusalem. Okay? As, as we've studied in the past, in 1 Samuel, back in chapter 7, 20 years ago, the high priest and his sons took, well, the high priest Eli didn't, but his sons took the ark into battle against the Philistines as kind of a lucky rabbit's foot. And they lost it. Right? Well, eventually it came back, but there were some problems with it in that it was holy and the people weren't. And so they left it at what we read here, Baal Judah, which is also the same place we know as Kirjath Jerim. Okay? You might have heard it called that. We called it that back in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, Kirjath Jerim. So it's been there for 20 years. Okay? This Ark of God, it's called here. It's also known as the Ark of the Testimony. In it, God had commanded Moses back in Exodus to make this ark about three and a half feet long, about two and a half feet wide, and two and a half feet tall. Basically, it's a box or a chest, and overlay it with gold, and then put a solid gold lid on it, and on the top of the lid, two cherubim, or cherubs, okay? Cherubs, uh, plural cherubim, two angels, who sit on top of this covering of the ark, solid gold, and they're always looking down over it. It says this is where the presence of God dwells. And then it would be in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, where Moses would go to meet with God, and God would be there at this place. Now, we followed the ark throughout many uh, journeys as it's come and gone. Here it's in Kirjath Jerim, and David wants to bring it into the Holy Temple. Um, but it, it's been a while since it's been in its rightful place. Um, so they wanted to bring it up, the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name Hashem, is the Hebrew. That's what Jews often use when they want to talk about God. Or when they come across the Tetragrammaton in your Bible, you know that better, like the capital N-H-V-H, the four capital letters, tetragrammaton, okay? Because we don't know how to pronounce the name of God. The vowels are absent. It's only consonants. But when a devout Jew, even to this day, comes to that word in their Bible, they won't say, well, for starters, what they can't say because they don't know how to pronounce it. Best guess, Yahweh. Some people would say Jehovah, but we don't know for sure. But a Jew would say, Hashem. Shem is just the word that means name. You have a Shem and I have a Shem. We all have Shems. We all have names. Then it is, that's his name. Whatever it is, that's his name. Hashem. So this ark is called by his name, by the name, Hashem, or Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, which is to say Yahweh Sabah. Okay, Hashem Yahweh Sabah, who dwells between the cherubim. So this is something quite special. Now, we read about it in our Bible, and you're like, yeah, I know, I've read about it before and everything. But seriously, if I had it right here tonight, you'd be like, whoa! Whoa! That's where God, he, he comes down on that thing, right? In fact, once a year, they'd keep it in the tabernacle, and only once a year the high priest was allowed to go in. First he had to wash himself, cleanse himself, do all these sacrifices, and then he could only enter in through the veil once a year with the blood of sacrifice, and they would sprinkle the blood on that covering. Kapoor is the word for covering. That's the day of Yom Kippur, 
the day of atonement, where they would sprinkle blood on what is called the mercy seat, where God would look at that blood and have mercy on the nation Israel. Those angels looking down would be like angels looking down from heaven, and they would see that blood, and God would then be merciful to the nation for one more year. Um, kind of a, so it's, it's a pretty big deal, and they want to bring it back home. We get that. Uh, you know, it's, it should be rightfully with the children of Israel. God gave it to them as his testimony, a remembrance. In it, he had ordered, you can read this in Hebrews chapter 9, that they would put in the two tablets that God wrote the commandments on with his own finger. They were inside that ark, in that, in that chest. Also, the pot, a gold pot, filled with manna. That, that would remind them that God always provided for them those 40 years in the wilderness. And also that rod that budded, that stick that showed the authority rested in Aaron and the priesthood. And so these items are inside there as a testimony to God's word, to God's grace, to God's provision to them. Everywhere they went, it would be there. So this is the deal. Verse 3, so they set the ark of God on a new cart, not some old jalopy they built a new car and brought it out of the house of abinadab which was on the hill and usa his name means strength and ahio his name means friendship or friendly the sons of abinadab drove the new car man have you ever been to a parade and you've seen the what is it, the, the the grand marshal Whoever the city fathers decide gets the special seat in the back of the convertible Cadillac and drives through the parade and waves at everybody, right? These guys get to ride on the new cart with the ark. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a cool deal. Um, so they built a new cart and they got on that thing and they, they verse 4, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, and accompanied the ark of God. And a heel went before the ark, so he gets Master, to be. Yes. What? Where are you? I'm in Second uh, Samuel six. I'm at verse four right now. All right. So, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanied the ark of God, and a heel went before the ark. Okay. So, from where they are at Kirjath Jerim, it's north of Jerusalem, but it's downhill. Jerusalem sits at the summit of the mountains that run from north to south in Israel. And so it's about nine miles north, but they have to go nine miles now uphill to get to Jerusalem. And this is the parade route, if you will. Okay. Uh, then David and the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cistrums, and on cymbals. It was quite the parade, right? You could hear them coming a mile away, right? And were they ever just excited? This was a big production. It was a big deal. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, you remember what a threshing floor is? It's the place where they would take the wheat or the barley, they would take the bundles of the stalks, the sheaves, and they would spread it out, and they'd run over it with an ox or with a cart wheel, and they would break the uh, grain away from the chaff and the stubble, and because they would sit up on a, a hillside, there'd be a breeze. It was usually just a stone, flat stone area. The breeze would blow away the chaff, and they'd gather up the grain, okay? So they'd come to this place that's nation's threshing floor, all rock, so a solid, you know, kind of a thing. They came to nations threshing for, and Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and said, whoa, look at me. Here I am with the ark of God. Somebody, let's get a selfie. <laughs> That's not exactly how it happened, is it? Nation, <laughs> Uzzah the, the, put out his hand. He's a strong guy, at least his name is strong, to, to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumble, okay? Something rattled the ark. Something caused the ark to jiggle, potentially even fall. We don't know the full story of just how much jeopardy was there, but it was something that caused Uzzah to think, I better grab a hold of this thing. Then, uh, and when they came to nation especially for Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took a hold of it for the oxen stumble, 
Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. <sighs> Not such a fun parade anymore, is it? Now, in this, we talk about his error, okay? And literally, that idea of error, it's translated out of a Hebrew word, which really means irreverence. So his error, his mistake in grabbing hold of the ark was to not revere God, not to respect God, not to honor God, not to obey God. He was being irreverent. That was his error. Well, what was he doing that was so wrong? If we go to Numbers chapter 4, it's a chapter that explains how the nation of Israel is to pack up camp every time they would go from place to place. And the priests and the Levites had their duties of picking up the curtains and the wall that surrounded the tabernacle, then the tent itself, and also the things that went inside the tent. And there were three tribes of the priests that had their jobs. The one who took care of the furniture in the ta tabernacle was the tribe of Kohath. If I pick up reading here at Numbers 14, uh, I'll pick up at verse uh, 14 just to give it a little running start. Then they, that's the sons of Kohath, the priests, shall put on it, shall put on it all its temp implements, which when they minister there, the fire pans, the forks, the shovels, the basins, the utensils of the altar, they shall spread it on it a covering of badger skins and insert its poles. So this is talking about the ark and even the uh, table of showbread and the um, the menorah. They all had a place where you would carry it using poles through rings. So you wouldn't actually touch the furniture, but you'd run the pole through the ring and then you'd pick it up and set it on your shoulder. But first they had to cover it before they picked it up. And they could kind of do it in such a way, at least you can imagine, from the outside in. So they would strike the tent and then those inner coverings, they would just, from the outside, just wrap it around the furniture so they didn't even have to see the furniture. This is something the priest, the high priest would do, but the common people didn't even necessarily see these things, okay? And so they were, there's a special way there to go about this with reverence and respect and honor, awe and fear, you could say. Verse 15, and when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them. But they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. Did you understand that or should I read it again? What did it say? Do not touch any holy thing or else curtains for you lest you die. Okay, so that could even include the fire pans and the, all the different equipment that went in there. Not just the ark, but certainly the ark. You weren't supposed to touch it. Even Aaron didn't touch it. He sprinkled blood on it, and when they went to move it, they would cover it, but they never touched it. Just kind of an idea of ultimate reverence. Well, Uzzah reached out and grabbed a hold of it. It could be that he just wasn't thinking. Or it could be that his thinking was wrong. He could be thinking, it didn't matter who carried the ark. A lot of people, how would you know? Unless you knew the scriptures, unless you knew what God's word said, he could be thinking, it didn't matter how you carried the ark. He could be thinking, I know all about the ark. It's been in my house for 20 years. Right? What, what's that saying? Familiarity brings contempt, not reverence. It could be that he's thinking that, I better do something. God's got a problem here and I need to help him. We do that, don't we? It could be he's thinking, well, this nation's threshing floor, it can't touch that. That's unholy. Well, what makes you think your hands are any holier? It could be thinking that the testimony of God needs my help. Now, certainly God has called us to minister with him. But we have to understand that God can and will do things 
according to the way he has set forth. And he clearly said, do not touch any of the holy things lest you die. It doesn't mean that you will die. The Philistines had it. They had it. They moved it from city to city and their temples, are, their idols are falling over and then they put it on a cart with the cow and they sent it back. It was in Kirjath the Reem. They didn't kill them. Okay? But in this case, they proposed to go forward in all this pageantry, a big production, right? They've got a new cart. It's almost kind of like how we do things sometimes as a church. We want to help God's testimony out a little bit. So what do we do? Let's spice it up. Let's turn up the volume. Let's get a really rocking worship team here. Let's get some really great speakers. Let's, let's do this, you know. It's like the cart, what is it's made of just boards and, and wheels. And it's like, oh, I know. We'll get the hospitality committee and the church board and we'll put the boards together and we'll get some big wheels and we'll make a big production. We need a new car because we really want to make this a big deal, right? And it's kind of funny in all of this, these people that are building this big parade, you could call them paraders of the lost ark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> but they, they, miss, they missed the most important Thing. Yeah, they got the new cart. Yeah, they got the tambourines and the drums and they got the music and they've got the they've got everything. But what they didn't have was the right heart. That heart of worship. God says we must worship him on his terms. And he's laid down many terms. One of them is don't touch it or you'll die. The Bible's full of this is how I will be approached by you. In fact, people often look at the book of Leviticus and they're like, oh, that's such a hard book. I fall asleep every time I read it. It's like it's so full of details of the priest of this is how to worship God. You want to know how to worship God? Read Leviticus. He's laid it out. This is how I should be approached. Now, I understand it's difficult because that's 3,000 years ago. They do things different then. <laughs> It's going to take a little bit of riddling it through, interpreting it all. But there is a way to approach God. There, in fact, there's only one way to approach God. There was a gate 15 feet wide in the curtains on the east side of the camp. That's the only way to get in. But when you came through there, you had to hit the laver. And you had to wash. And you had to be cleansed before you could approach God. But you still had to bring an offering, a sacrifice. And you couldn't approach God except for the blood of a sacrifice. And you would have to then enter into his presence, into his holy place. And in that, you would come to his menorah. You'd have to enter into his light. And you'd have to enter into his provision, the table of showbread. And you'd have to come in prayer, the altar of incense. But even then, as you entered into his presence, you still couldn't come into the holy of holies. That was reserved for the high priest, representing God to the people and people to the God, and it would be done through the sacrifice of the Lamb on behalf of the nation. And this is how we approach God. We must approach God through Jesus Christ. He's a picture of the tabernacle. He's a picture of the ark. He's a picture of all these things. And they weren't doing that. It was irreverent. Now, I meant to do three chapters tonight. I'll be lucky if I get through one. But on the issue of reverence, and irreverence. We do need to be careful how we approach God. Would it be wrong to approach God with sandals? Nobody knows? If it is, we got a problem, right? Because the Bible's full of people wearing sandals. Would it be a problem to approach God in shorts. Again. Don't wear your shorts, Pastor. Well, I, I, I'm just, I, I'm going into some area that's, can, I'm, we're, not the, we're not the youth. We're, we're people of a different generation, aren't we? There's rules in society. 
about how things ought to be done. And, and we do need to be doing things decently and in order with respect. And we need to be mindful of these things. But there's some things we're going to see, if I go fast enough before the night's over, that may challenge some of our ideas of what is within the boundaries of reverence and irreverence. Fundamentally, it's not reverent to disobey God. And when God clearly says, don't touch it, don't touch it. Okay, thou shall, thou shall not. Those are pretty clear black and white lines that we follow. Right, but let's look, we'll, uh, let's look at how this plays out as we go a little bit forward, okay? Worship is not doing what pleases us. I know, I, 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 I'm as guilty of this as one, the next person, but sometimes have you ever gone to church and you go, oh, that was so awesome, I just felt so great. Well, good for you. But was it worship? Were you serving God? Were you blessing God? Were you honoring God? Were you praising God? Were you obeying God? Because if you were, then you were worshiping. But if it was just a really fun time, I might not, I might not label that worship, right? Worship literally, there's several different words that are used, Old Testament, New Testament, but here the idea is shaka, which is to bow down, to prostrate yourself before deity. And it's an act of a servant before the Lord. I'm here to serve you. That's worship. Are you here to serve? Okay. We can serve him with our heart, with our lips, with our words, with our deeds, with our actions. But is it for him or for us? Well... We can see in this parade, and we're going to see as things open up, and especially when we get to commentary in First Chronicles, they were serving themselves. There, that was fundamentally the problem behind this paraders of the lost ark. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Usa, and he called the name of the place Perez Usa to this day. Perez simply means an outbreak, or God broke through, or, you know, they name that place. Nations threshing for nowadays is called Perez Uza. Okay, uh, David was angry, and and that's the 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 word means he was kindled, he was incensed, he was wroth. There's an old good King James version word, wroth. He was uh, hot. He was displeased. He was grieved. He responded. Emotionally, anger, common response. And I can imagine, after all the work that he did, we built a new cart. We got the whole priesthood out here. I got so many people worshiping. There's a train going for a mile. We, look at, look at, and you went and ruined it, God. And you killed that guy. He was angry. Verse 9, David was afraid. After the temper cooled, after his rage calmed down, he became afraid. Actually, the word is dread, terror, or, and this word is often, reverence he paused and he thought about it for a minute and all of a sudden he's like here I am angry and we're dealing with God of the universe holy God who am I to point my finger at him cast aspersions upon him be angry with God and have you ever been in that place have you ever blown up you know, you let your emotions get the best of you and you just fly off the handle and all of a sudden you realize, not only have I made a real fool of myself, but I have misrepresented the Lord I serve, but also my 
shall I say, wedding vow? Ooh. I misrepresented my authority as a parent? Wow. And you start all of a sudden, you're like, boy, now you, you just go instantly all of a sudden into uh, fear. And what if I, I'm in a bad place? That's a good place to be. Uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? That's a good place. He now is afraid. This is the first step to fixing this problem. He was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, How can the ark of, God, of the Lord come to me? Again, I told you several times now over the last couple of weeks. Look for these phrases of David off of his lips. He inquired of the Lord. He asked, he seeked what God's will would be. This is the thing that sets David apart from King Saul and frankly from pretty much every other king that we read about in the scriptures. He's a man after God's own heart. That doesn't mean he's perfect. But he had, the bra he had the bracelet, I guess. What would Jesus do? What do you want me to do? How? How do I bring this ark into Jerusalem? I can't do it by myself. Very good. Very good. You need me, David. So, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, little throwaway there, but in 1 Chronicles 26, we learn about Obed-Edom, the Gittite. He was a Levite of the family of Kohath, and he happened to live nearby. Okay, this is a good idea. This is what the Bible says. This is a Kohathite. They're supposed to take care of the ark. Let's just leave it there until we can sort this out and figure it all out. You ready for me to mess with you a little bit? Why not? I'm gonna, so I just want to <laughs> warn you. <laughs> Look what it says. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David, what does it say in your Bible? Took, took it. How do you think he took it? With the poles? Somehow, David went and grabbed this thing and took it into the house. And he didn't die. And you can wrestle with that one for the rest of your life. Because there is no answer as to why he didn't get struck like Usa. We don't know. You can't put God in a box. You're supposed to laugh. That was a funny one, too. <laughs> but we do this, don't we? We do this. Now, I would expect that the difference between what happened to Uzzah and what happened to David, and this is purely my speculation, but Uzzah, the man of strength, did it in irreverence, in the flesh, in pride. Whereas David, now he's moved to dread, to terror, and to reverence. And in that, he's able to move it and put it with obed until they can figure it out. God looks upon the heart. I think we've heard that somewhere, haven't we? When Samuel comes to the sons of Jesse, and it's like, this one, no, this one, no, this one. Are there any more? Well, there's a, that kid. He's not important. He's out watching the sheep. And what does uh, God have to tell Samuel? God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. And I would suspect the heart of David was right here. And I would suspect that based on what we see following. Okay? Um, verse 11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I, what was I doing? I was doing nothing. A parade went by this day, and all of a sudden, a guy died, and the king came to my house. He put the ark in my house, and everything's just been great ever since. Wow. Right? Well, not only would Obed-Edom notice that, everybody would have noticed that. Um, in 1 Chronicles, I'm going to go to 1 Chronicles 15 and read a little bit. Verses 1 through 3, uh, a little bit of commentary on this. Verse 15, 
or chapter 15, 1 Chronicles, verse 1. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord God has chosen them to carry the ark of God and a minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. I mentioned in previous times. Chronicles has most all the same stories that you read in First in Samuel and in Kings, but it kind of comes from the perspective from the priesthood. It's as if God is giving commentary on what we read in Samuel and in Kings. Here in Samuel tonight, we're getting man's point of view, David and what he did. Now in Chronicles, you get a little bit different idea, and God fills in some of the pieces here where David says, yeah, we can't do this. The Levites have to do it, right? And so there's a little bit in there. In verses 12 through 16, um, in preparing to move the ark, these are instructions in 1 Chronicles 15, I'm sorry, verses 12 through 16, going on. He said, He, God, said to them, You are the heads of the fathers, houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves. Set yourself apart. Prepare yourself. Don't just come into this as some casual thing. Get ready to meet God. You and your brethren, that you may bring the ark of the Lord uh, up, uh, that you may bring the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for you. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord to the God of Israel and all the children of the Levites before the ark of the God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded, according to the word of God. Okay? So there's a little bit more detail as to what was going on in this. Going on, uh, I'll pick up verse 12 now in verse 6 of uh, 2 Samuel. Now... It was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was, when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fattened sheep. Okay? Now, the Bible doesn't have to say that they have to stop and do sacrifices every six paces. This is something that David has added to it, although you could presume at your own peril, but you could presume that David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Go ahead and start this thing with some sacrifices because that's how I want to be known by my people. Okay? And we're going to see as they go forward, they're going to be offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, offerings of consecration to the Lord and offerings of fellowship with God. Okay, so they, they did these offerings, and uh, then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Again, back in 1 Chronicles 15 where we were at, just like all, all the priests, all the Levites, everybody were wearing the same thing. Basically, it would be similar to a slip that a lady would wear under a dress. I don't know that's done very often anymore, um, but nevertheless... Basically, it's just a, like a nightshirt that would go down maybe to your knees. It's linen. That would be the undergarment of the priests, although this is the garment they would work in when they went to work. What do priests do for a living? They sacrifice. They receive these animals. They butcher them all day long. They're working in these linen ephods, and this is kind of that picture. It's the picture of the servant. Yes, you're a priest. Yes, you're a Levite. Yes, you're a servant of God. But keep in mind, you are a servant. You're not all high and mighty. You're not a big wheel. You're a servant of God. And so David and everybody dresses now for this procession with the ark in dignity. Or at least that's the way he saw it. And then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. That word for dance comes out of a, a term which means he whirled about. 
So he wasn't doing the two-step or the foxtrot or he was just dancing, jumping, spinning. Not something so uncommon that you would see in the Middle East today when people are really enjoying themselves. We were at the Wailing Wall um, the night of um, that Passover came on in Israel. And it was a beautiful thing to watch uh, all the um, Jews of all the different uh, flavors, all the different dresses and stuff, Orthodox Jews and everything. And they're there dancing, and they, they do the dancing where they got their hands on everybody's shoulders. But people are doing all kinds of dancing. It was a time of celebration. It was a cool thing. And this is what David is kind of doing. He's whirling about. He's dancing with, before the Lord. It says, with all his might. And I'm thinking, if that was me, that would be an ugly sight. <laughs> I'm not gifted with rhythm. <laughs> I'm not a dancer, right? Um, but I have occasionally got out on the floor and gave it my best. And it's, it's not a pretty picture. Of course, David, he's a musician. He's probably got some groove. I, you know, I, I would think it was probably fun and beautiful. And everybody's probably really enjoying themselves. This wonderful procession and the music and, and all of these things going on. And everybody's just so excited. Now, so David... And all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the shout of a trumpet. This kind of brings me back to um, what I was saying about what is reverent and what is not reverent. Sandals, shorts, singing, drums. They're actually listed here. Along with the cymbals and the, uh, all the different things. The, um, the cis drums. Um, so... A lot of times you're going to have to look at what is um, biblical, and there's a lot of room in the Bible for music and worship. There are some denominations that don't have music in worship. They have their reasons. It's hard for me to understand because I, I see a lot of music in worship, right? We've got a whole psalm book that not only is uh, worship to God, prayers and hymns set to music it even tells us what instruments some of them should be played with so there's a room for there's room for i believe music singing dancing in worship now i say all of that and i realize that i could be cutting my own neck you probably heard me in the last couple months <laughs> Discussing from the pulpit some of our housekeeping during announcements. You know, please shut off your cell phone. If you have a baby, we have a m mother's room. Or you can go down the hallway and try not to be a disruption to the class oh, in the room. And oh, by the way, you know, you're here. You're free to worship when you come to worship. If you feel like you want to drop to your knees, drop to your knees. Want to sit? Sit. Even if you want to stand or if you want to raise your hands. But I will say this, if you get out in the aisles and start dancing around, I'll probably come down and tackle you. <laughs> and this is, this is what I, now I, this, so that you know, I'm not talking what the Bible says right here. I'm telling, this is what Mike says, and I very well may need some further education on this. But I, when we come to worship, is it about us or is it about God? I think that was the problem with the first parade. It was a big show. It was a big production. And you want to check your heart. Why are you sitting there with your hands folded while you sing? That's not wrong. But why? Well, this is how I show reverence to God. Amen. Good. Why are you standing and raising your hands? Well, this is how I show reverence to God. I will say, and this is where different churches have different styles. Let's put it that way. In this, if you, there's a line that you can cross and, and you may not even be aware of it sometimes. Maybe you need a brother or sister to point it out for you. But when you start doing certain things, even singing super loud off key, with all your heart, you may start drawing attention to you 
and away from God and away from what we're worshiping. And that's why as we come together, especially like on a Sunday morning, or even tonight, as a community, we have community worship. And we have kind of a community way that we flow. And nobody's surprised here if you were to put your hands in the air. But nobody expects you to. But we kind of know that if you start dancing in the aisle, all of a sudden nobody's thinking about Jesus anymore. They're just watching Mike do something odd. Is he okay? Maybe he's having an epileptic fit. What's he doing? You know? I'm, I'm trying to be lighthearted about this because it's kind of a touchy subject. I want us to be free to worship. Clearly, clearly. It's really hard to teach this passage and not recognize that David danced with all his might. He put everything into it. He was jumping and whirling and twirling. He was going for it. And he was the leader. He's the one that put this together. And that's another thing that I would say. Having been in many countries, in many different churches, in many different countries, lots of different style. And I would just encourage you to maybe look around and see what the locals are doing. Just how do they do it in this church? And, and try to, you know, fit in. I'm not, I'm not trying to put a uh, quench your spirit. But at the same time, we want to make sure that our spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, I don't bring attention to myself. I point to Jesus. So if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we want people to look to Jesus. Okay? Amen. So... So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Verse 16. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, you remember that's his first wife, okay? He was awarded her, if you will. Saul says, whoever kills Goliath can marry my daughter and never pay taxes, you know? And... Uh, when it came time to marry Saul's daughter, Saul had already married off the daughter he promised, and he got Michael, the other daughter. And in time, Saul became mad and chased David away, and for 20 years he's on the run, 15 years, hiding in caves, running around. Well, at, during that time, Saul took Michael's, David's daughter and gave him to another man. So when now David is coming back into his kingdom, he asks for his wife back. You remember that story? This was a couple chapters back. Anyways, he's got his wife back, but I would say it's less than an ideal marriage. So Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She thought... She was ashamed of him, and she thought very little of him. And she's even going to say so. Okay, that'll come in just a minute. Verse 17. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So they're continuing. I mean, not only was this a parade of the ark, and the Levites, and the singers, and the musicians, but there was a lot of animals. If they're stopping and sacrificing, and here they get to the tent, and there's more sacrificing, it was quite the affair. Nine miles from Kirjath Dream, or a little bit less than that, from Obed, uh, Edom's house. Verse 18, And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among all the whole multitude of Israel, both women and men to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. That's quite a deal. I mean, I, don't, I can't even imagine how much that would be. In our hospitality ministry, we're kind of taken aback when we run out of hot dogs. <laughs> oh, wow, what are we going to do now? You know, it's like... God, by God's grace, we always have enough, but it's like, boy, um, <laughs> here, this would have been quite quite the blessing. He blessed everybody and sent them, what a great day. Everybody goes home, just super, super blessed. 
the ark of testimony, the presence of God is in Jerusalem, in the city of David, in the tabernacle, in the tent that David built for it. Wow, this is like the consummation of his kingdom. Everything is right with the world. David's been anointed and anointed again and now a third time and he takes control of the city of Jerusalem. He brings the ark in and we are, we are in great shape right now. Everybody's so happy. Verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. Oh yeah, you guys get some bread and raisin cakes and meat and everything too. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said... How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. In case you're not tracking, that sarcasm. Okay, that is not what she means when she says how glorious was the king of Israel today. What she means is the exact opposite. It says you're behaving like one of the base fellows or vain people, godless people, shamelessly, openly uncovering himself. You are, be, you are so undignified. You're the king of Israel and you're acting like a common servant. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. So just to get a couple of things straight here, and this is kind of cutting back against the grain, if you will, but it's also quite true. It was the Lord who chose David over Saul. If you remember, I'm going to take you back, but remember when God first tapped Saul, Samson, Samuel came, anointed him, and he ran away, remember? He ran away to the prophets. And if you remember, he was there with the prophets making music, prophesying, going on. He aspired to be a musician and a prophet. But he wasn't, and he became anything but. His heart wasn't towards God. And David says here, listen, it was God that chose me over your father to lead his people, the people of the Lord over Israel. Not my kingdom, and that was the problem with Saul. It was all about Saul's kingdom. And here David is like, I am just leading the people. This is, this is what was in my heart. And it was a beautiful expression of just total devotion to God. Just joy and ecstasy. Um, it's almost like, it, you know, it'd be like going to somebody's wedding, right? And you go through all the different things at the reception. But there's a place at the wedding where the bride and groom usually dance, right? It's not like a law that you have to do that. But if you're not much of a dancer... <laughs> It doesn't almost matter. You're going to get out there and dance. Because that's everybody expects it, right? But here you are with your beloved, your, your bride or your, your husband. And if you're going to dance, then dance. This is what you're out here to do, dance. And David's like, I'm going to dance. And he did, okay? Uh, so David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father, and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play, and that would be music, before the Lord. And I will be even more undignified than this. And will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken by them, I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael the daughter of Saul had no children to the day of her death. Now, that's an awkward kind of a sentence. Does that mean that God cursed her? Or maybe <laughs> they just weren't a happy couple and there were no marital relationships and they didn't have any kids. We don't know. But we do see here that Michael 
is kind of playing for the other team. She's pitching for Saul. And Saul has been rejected. And Saul's dynasty has been destroyed. And here's David, and all he's doing is, he said, becoming undignified. Yes, I could have wore my robes and my crown and all that. Of course, I'm the king. But I humbled myself. I became as nothing that I could truly worship my Lord. We have a New Testament picture of that in the son of David, as he's known, Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, of course, Michael didn't have this to read, but it would be handy to hand it to her. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Yeah, he could have put on airs. King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler of the universe. He could have come with robes and all kinds of stuff, but he didn't. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He just became like you and me. That's what David did. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him, given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is a picture for us. Amen. David said, I humbled myself. You can imagine how humbling that would be to go out in front of everybody in your skivvies <laughs> and dance for God. Well, that's a little crass. I'm just, I said it for effect. But in David's day as the king, the expectation was he would be royalty. But before the king of kings, the lord of lords, he couldn't wear his robes. He couldn't have put on his crown. He had to come to him as a simple man and just worship him in spirit, in truth, to be honest with him. And this is a picture of what he's done. Um, I meant to cover some more chapters, but because of time, we can call that a night. How many of you guys know the song Undignified? I will dance, I will sing, to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is separate, uh, linked, hindering the passion of my soul. I come even more undignified than this. Lay my pride by my side. I'll become even more undignified than this. <laughs> Some may think I'm mad. Michael thought David was mad. At the end of the day, as we worship God, God has given us a way to do it. And he's given us his word. God has given us his son. We must come before God, come to God through Jesus Christ. There's variety in the way that we may express ourselves, but we need to do a heart check. Why are we doing what we're doing? Is it for pride? Is it for the show? Is it to make a big deal, you know? We need to be careful about that. Churches, we want to do good. When we have events, we're having the youth conference this weekend. We want to do a really good job. We want to bring great speakers for these kids. We want to have good worship for them. We want to have good food for them. We want things to go well. We want to make a really nice production, a really nice show of it. But at the end of the day, if the kids just come and they're entertained and they have some good food and they go home and it hasn't touched them or changed their heart, we wasted our time. It has to begin with, Lord, how do I bring the ark into the city of David? How do I bring you into whatever it is I'm doing? Whatever it is that I'm doing, Lord, help me figure out how I should do that. And then what he tells you to do, do it. Even if it's a little humbling. Even if it's not as dignified as you were thinking it might be. 
I, <laughs> I, I work with a lot of uh, people that want to go into ministry, teaching in Bible colleges and uh, the different things. And you get so many young men and young women that want to go into ministry. And you always want to know, you know, why do you want to do that? You know, um, honestly, it's, it's, it's got some amazing moments. It's got some mountaintop moments, but a great deal of it's just slugging it out down in the valleys. It's not what you might think it is. And if you think you're doing it because of the title, right, or the reserved parking space at the church, <laughs> you, you really missed the boat. <laughs> so... At any rate, uh, Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this lesson in humility, this lesson in propriety, this lesson in reverence, this lesson in awe and respect, but also, Lord, this lesson in love and joy, in, in being able to just enjoy you without any strings attached. Help us, Lord, to walk freely with you with you, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen.